Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I am here with Lisa J. Puretti, the executive director and co-founder of the International Hyperhidrosis Society. Lisa, can you introduce yourself and your organization? I sure can. I've been doing it for about 20 years now. So I started the International Hyperhidrosis Society in 2003. I have a master's in international economics and also one in marketing. And my undergraduate is in design. So that's why you see lots of beautiful stuff coming from the IHHS. I also married a designer who helps us all the time to look as gorgeous as we can. Um, I started the International Hyperhidrosis Society to bring forth the respect and um, dignity that's, that's re needed for people who are suffering from excessive sweating. So I saw it as a stigmatized condition that needed to be validated and for awareness to be built and for the care to be brought up. <laughs> because the care in 2003 was really almost non-existent, as you can attest to, right, Maria? Absolutely, yeah. I struggled for a long time before I was able to find an organization, let alone treatment options, that could help me. Um, and typically, hyperhidrosis um, starts early in life, you know, mm -hmm. adolescence. Um, how can parents or caregivers recognize signs of hyperhidrosis in kids? Yeah. So what we're finding is we're actually in the middle of a really intense and in-depth research project with um, Dermira, who's the maker of Cubrexa. So they have sponsored this research project that is um, really quite stunning into the impact of hyperhidrosis on adolescents. So it's from kids age eight to 18. And um, what we're finding is that the impact has an arc to it and that at the beginning when kids have it, it doesn't bother them so much, although the parents usually pick up on it because usually the parents have it themselves. And then as the child goes through puberty and is starting to, it, their, their self-consciousness just increases exponentially. You're nodding. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so it goes from kind of not bothering them. That's just who I am. And, and now this isn't everyone, of course. We we certainly have little ones who are really traumatized by excessive sweating. But then it goes through an arc, and then we see in adults that they learn coping mechanisms. So again, it, it kind of circles back to who they are. So, and Maria, you're, you're a, a testament to that too. I mean, you 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 know muscle through it. Yeah. So to your question, how do they how do how do parents know? How does anyone know if they have a primary focal hyperhidrosis? So what's really cool is that we have a diagnostic guide. So it's the A through Gs. And I don't know if your community is familiar with this. It's relatively new. We're working on publishing it. But what I hope is that this will become a standardized way to diagnose primary focal hyperhidrosis so that the prevalence numbers and the care can also become standardized. And we won't have you know, some people seeing one doctor getting a proper diagnosis and other people that have the same symptoms seeing another doctor and having a different diagnosis. So I would, right? So right. we love to like bring it down and let's, let's get clear on what are the rules of the game here. So we start with A, which is the age of onset. And we know that with primary focal hyperhidrosis, it starts below the age of 18. For hands and feet, it usually I usually think of it as like middle school or elementary school. And for the underarms, it's usually high school. And one reason for this, we think, is that there are two different genes that and or epigenetics that account for the different expression of this hyperactivity of the sweat glands. So that trigger it. So then B is bilateral. So if you have it on your right hand, you have it on your left hand, and right foot, left foot, underarm, same thing. And also importantly, if it's on your face, you wanna make sure for primary focal hyperhidrosis, it's on both sides of your face or both sides of your head. And the reason why I say you wanna make sure of that is because if it's only on one side of your body, it could be an indication of an underlying condition or even medication and, uh, that you're taking. And it's a really important distinction because you wanna mm -hmm. get after that, the, under, the, the underlying cause. So what letter am I up to? Just B, bilateral. My goodness, yeah. I can't hurry up. <laughs> so let, let's talk about C. So C is ceasing, ceases when sleeping. So a primary focal hyperhidrosis will stop when you're sleeping. Now, 
we definitely see lots of kids that are sweating at night and lots of adults that are sweating at night probably because of something else going on. So you can sweat during the day because of primary and you can sweat at night because of secondary. So I never wanna say if, if you sweat at night, you don't have primary focal hyperhidrosis. It's like, if you only sweat at night. So is, mm -hmm. that, is that clear? Okay, great. Yeah. So E is one of your favorites, episodic, right? So you have distinct episodes of your hyperhidrosis and they happen frequently, usually, like what's what's yours? Are you daily or are you three times a week? What do, what do you have? What do you oh think? my gosh, it's daily. I mean, okay. I'm I'm literally sitting here with a towel, so I'm okay. sweating right now, <laughs> and okay. I have a fan okay. on. So <laughs> okay, I was literally with a towel when I was reading your questions, getting prepared for this, which is why I had to put the questions away. Oh. <laughs> So that's so that's ceases when sleeping. Um, C D oh duration duration. I'm sorry. Yeah. So duration is um, that they've had it for longer than six months and almost everyone, you know, so you want to just like, you know, is this, a, is this something that just popped up or is this something that you've had longer than six months? Because if it just popped up, it could be a new medication that you're trying or you could have, you know, symptoms of an underlying condition. Mm -hmm. Letters C, D, E, F, family. Yes. So other members of your family, and remember this is blood relatives. So if lots of folks who, you know, if you're adopted or um, if you're part of a, you know, a mixed family, it's of course your blood relatives. So that's one of those things when um, companies ask me to look at their protocols. So this, this was a, um, a glitch that I saw in a protocol long ago when they were looking at the prevalence of hyperhidrosis. So I, went, I brought it to their attention that they need to be clear on how you define family because the blood relatives. Right. Yeah. So, and then, and in the last is G, which is gets in the way. And you can, I mean, how many stories can you? <laughs> can oh my you gosh. Have? I could write an encyclopedia of stories. How it right. gets Just in the way of my life. Yeah. <laughs> gets in the way. That's a really long answer to your question, but it's lots of information in there that, that I, I hope that uh, makes folks feel empowered because you, you can go through it and you can know what's going on. Mm -hmm. and we're, we're bringing this forward to the healthcare providers so that everybody's on the same page on this is what primary focal hyperhidrosis is. That's great. Now you talked about family and epigenetics. So where are we with um, studies about you know, the cause of hyperhidrosis, okay. is it genetic? Can we all go get tested yet to determine right. if we have that gene? How do we stop that gene? Yeah, I wish it, the studies were paused many years ago just for lack of funding because once they realized, when they discovered that it looked like it was two genes that were um, being ex ex expressed, then all of a sudden the study became exponentially larger and the money ran out. So, yeah. Darn it. Um, I don't know if anyone's still studying it. Um, you know, if I do find out, it'll be in our blog and we'll, okay. we'll be the first to talk about it. Okay, great. Now, can you tell me a little bit more about what the International Hyperhidrosis Society is doing this month for Hyperhidrosis Awareness Month? Yeah. What aren't we doing on this? So we have, it's a very busy month for everyone. It's a very busy year for everyone. So on one hand, we want to make sure that our messages are informative and comforting and educational. We certainly do not want to add to the noise, right? So we're being mm -hmm. very careful about that. Um, so we're providing actionable information, like um, there's some information in the CARES Act regarding using your FSA, and in the UK, it's another your savings account, your health savings account, so that you, you can use it for over-the-counter medications during this during the pandemic. And that's not just a US thing, that's that's global. So we'll be talking about that. We also have a really beautiful uh, podcast called our Hi Hi Hyperhidrosis Haiku podcast. And we have all kinds of people talking, making speaking their own hyperhidrosis haiku. If, if folks, even from uh, Dr. Glazer, Dr. Pariser, I'm in there, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Marilyn, Christine. So you'll hear lots of familiar voices of folks and we're inviting others to chime in. And that we will be releasing Thanksgiving week, thinking that maybe it's an, you know, poetry can heal. So maybe it'll be a nice thing to do during, during Thanksgiving. Oh, I love um, that. 
and a few other things that you'll have to just tune in and see. Um, we have some quizzes that are going on in published in um, uh, HCP publications like the Dermatologist. We right now have a um, every week we have a, um, a, a multiple choice quiz for them. And so maybe what I'll do is I'll try to take a screenshot of that and um, share it with the world. So um, see if the your audience and my audience, which I know, they are smarter than a dermatologist. Yes, <laughs> that's, yes, we that's are. Our goal. <laughs> yeah, well, and I often say, you know, we are our own best health advocates. We know our sweaty bodies better than anyone else does. And so that's why it's really important for people with hyperhidrosis to speak up and to use their voice. And I think um, what people may not know about the International Hyperhidrosis Society is that you serve more than one audience. Mm -hmm. You are the go-to resource for healthcare providers, physicians, nurses, medical assistants, but you also served me as a patient. And that was really when my life changed, was when I volunteered as a patient at one of your dermatology symposiums, and I received yeah. botulinum toxin injections in my hands. And that mm -hmm. day completely changed my life. It's, you know, it's the reason I'm a hyperhidrosis advocate now. So I just really want people to know that you can be a patient, you can be a parent, you can be a healthcare provider. No matter who you are, you can find help and hope through the International Hyperhidrosis Society. So I just thank you on behalf of everyone who's suffering, you know, the 365 million people worldwide who think that they're alone. You're not alone. And there, you guys are a global nonprofit organization dedicated to hyperhidrosis. So yep. if people, find your website and they're coming there the first time. Um, what are some of your tips maybe for navigating your website? Where should they start? Um, what is the best type of physician to seek help from? Someone educated by us. And you can tell that when you look in the clinician finder, you'll see IHHS educated in the profiles. And that means that that clinician attended one of our educational sessions that you volunteered for. So yeah. one, I think one of my favorite things that we did is um, the video that where we show kind of the backstory for educational events. So I don't know if you linked, or you could link to that so that folks can see what these events are. There's, there's nothing else like it out there. There's no other disease state that does the kind of work that we do to bring together clinicians and they, we make sure, we make sure that the clinicians learn from the patients. So we are very clearly telling them to flip the script here. And yeah. my faculty who are, who are world renowned dermatologists, they have you know, all the props in the world and they're with me in this. So we're, they are with me in saying, okay, so why don't you try it this way? Or did you ask the patient this? And, and you know, all of our volunteers like you guys are like, they didn't ask me, or you're giving feedback. You're an integral part of the training and the teaching, and that just no one else does. Um, yeah. I love that, and I also think that another highlight on our website is to go to our podcast and listen to the heart and soul of the IHHS, because it, it talks, it, as those of us who started it, we talk about what it means to us, um, and it's a really personal, it's a really personal podcast, so I think you know, it's, yes, it's an organization out there and thank you for bringing, you always want us to bring a face to it and a humanity to it, but I'm always too busy. So thank you for, for, for booking this and being patient yes. with me. Because it, yeah. it's just, it comes down to people and we're just working, working as hard as we possibly can to advocate for patients, sufferers, because they're too different, right? And right. innovators, trying to get them to create the right treatments for, that are better than what we have. We're trying to get the FDA to require those innovators to have better studies and better safety profiles for the, the treatments. You know, all the while, it, educating reporters even to make sure that they have the right facts out there about excessive sweating. So right. it, it is, it's the world. We're at the International Hyperhidrosis Society is at the crossroads of all the stakeholders. They all come into us. And, um, and we hear, we hear everything and then try to craft a better world and bring it back out there. Right. Um, back in November, 2017, we had the hyperhidrosis patient focused drug development meeting, the PFDD. 
and I was there, I was a guest speaker and you know, we all got to speak to members of the FDA and pharmaceutical companies. So what do you think we still are in need of from pharmaceutical companies when it comes to hyperhidrosis treatments? Hmm. So I think it's access is needed more now. I think that we have some better treatments, certainly than when I started, that's for sure, thank God. Um, mm -hmm. But I am concerned that treatment is becoming too expensive. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I'm concerned that fewer, not enough clinicians offer it. So, and off and take the time to stay in touch with their patients to learn how did that go for you? Was it as good as you expected? Do we need to tweak it? Do we need to add another treatment to it? So for example, you can have uh, mirror dry, but you might need some touch up with Botox. You might need a second treatment of mirror dry. You can, have, mm -hmm. you can have Botox treatment, but you might need certain dry to you know, help with the breakthrough or make the treatments last longer. Things like that, that you can have a really um, open and empowering conversation with your clinician if he or she is up on the ways to combine and tweak and improve. Um, right. So, so access and education, I think, of our clinicians. Now, one way that we are improving that is right now, probably picked up on this, is that we are sending out over, well, about 600 um, kits to uh, physicians who, clinicians who are registered in our clinician finder. And these kits, again, my, my goal is to make everyone on the same page and make the, the visits with your clinician as productive and efficient as possible. Because yeah. we know these clinicians are tight on time and at the same right. time, we wanna be listened to and we want our voice to be heard, right? right. So what, what we did was the kit that we gave them is a pre-appointment letter so that, oh. yeah. So you guys get an idea of the way the um, practice approaches hyperhidrosis. The second thing we want them to include in that pre-appointment letter and that we created for them is a hyperhidrosis questionnaire. And it basically goes through the A, B, C, D, E, F, Gs that we just did with you. And then on the back says, okay, what are the treatments that you've tried? And what on a scale of one to 10, wh why were they, you know, what was your satisfaction rate? Now what that does is get that, gets that conversation that the physician clinician should have with you in the office, it gets it done in advance. So they love that. And so do we, because yeah. it makes us think about it. And guess what else it does? It gets it in your chart so that your insurance will cover it better because they'll say, oh my goodness, they went through all this. Instead of starting from zero, an insurance says, well, they haven't tried to do it. They haven't even tried over the counter. So right. get them to do that and do another appointment. This is so much more efficient. Right. The other thing we did was we included information throughout the practice that they can put up, whether it's posters, magnets, and, and pins about let's talk about sweat. So what we try to do is blanket the practice with hyperhidrosis information mm -hmm. so that every moment you feel welcomed. That's my goal. I want you guys to feel like they've been expecting you and they are welcoming you. Exactly. Job. Now, I get a lot of questions um, about treatment options. You know, what can I take? Just make my sweating stop. What, what should I do? So as far as treatment options for hyperhidrosis, is there kind of a, an order that, that a patient would follow? Would they try oral medications first or over the counter? And, you know, can you talk just a little bit about that? Sure. So if you look in our um, published scientific literature, you'll see a paper that I published along with, um, I'm trying to think of who the lead author was. It could have been um, Dr. Paris or Glazer. Just scroll down, I think it was in um, 2016. And what we did was looked at the patient journey. And we, we asked, what, was, what are the treatments that you've tried and what, is, what was your rate of satisfaction? That was among many of the questions. But what we found was physicians repeatedly would prescribe Drysol, which is the prescription antiperspirant and oral medications. And those two had the lowest levels of satisfaction. Hmm. So what, right. So that was such an aha moment for us. So we said, okay, so these 
physicians, clinicians are prescribing these, patients go home, they try them, they hate them, or it doesn't work, or they can't stay on them because the side effects are so tough. And yet the, yet the clinician thinks that they, that was a success, and the next patient, that next sufferer that comes in gets the same treatment. So what we were trying to do is interrupt that and say, okay, so here's why. When you, when you just mentioned about oral medications, folks are not so pleased with oral medications because of the side effects. And there are so many yeah. other treatment options that, that you can try. Now, you'd only tr do oral medications probably if you have more than one area of primary focal hyperhidrosis. Okay. But I still, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead, Marie. Oh, no, I was just nodding. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> so I still think, you know, if you look at our treatment overview, you can see the matrix of the um, different treatments to try. And yeah. you know, you start with the least invasive. Start there. And you know, systemic medication can have systemic effect. And when you think about, you know, say for example, Cubrexa, um, what they tried to do in all the clinical studies and what they tried to do when they innovated the topical wipe is to make sure that that medication did not become systemic and did not have the side effect of oral medication. Otherwise, there's no improvement. So they were able to accomplish that with, the, with their chemistry. So that's a win. Right. And I also want to point out to everyone watching, each person's body is different. So what works for me may not work for you and vice versa. So d the point is, though, don't give up hope. There are a variety of treatment options out there for you but please make sure you do your research. Um, if you're just going on a random internet search and typing in cure for hyperhidrosis or best treatment for hyperhidrosis, you might see things that are paid advertisements. Um, so definitely look at that treatment matrix and start small and then go bigger or like Lisa said, more invasive um, because there are surgeries available. Those I would consider as a last resort not to say that those are bad procedures, but make sure you do your research, interview your surgeons, ask them about the side effect of compensatory sweating, and just make sure that you're making the best decision you can for yourself. Right. And in the um, sweat help, if you go to the sweating wear section, you can just dial down to the focal area. And we talk about, you know, start here, try this, try that, combine these. Like, for example, so you try iontophoresis, and I used to get this a lot less these days, thankfully. I think that the education is coming through. They would try iontophoresis, and they would say, it doesn't work. I've tried everything. It doesn't work. And I'm like, well, what device did you use? And what kind of water did you use? And how, how long did you use it for? And were you expecting to be dry after you took your hands out of the the you know water trays the first time so you know even for botox it takes about 10 days to fully you know take effect um right. it doesn't happen in a split second and then also there are ways to make it better so for using the iontophoresis for example if you're doing using the right quote unquote the right device for you the um the right procedure the right regimen um and it's still not working well you can add some crushed up anticholinergic medication. So that is a, and we even have the, the formula on our, on our website in the iontophoresis thing. So that can really amp up. You can, you know, make it that much better. So there are lots of ways. And, you know, some people, if they've had, say, Botox for their underarms and it didn't work, pretty unusual. That's usually an issue with the technique that the clinician provided. Right. Now, um, I just totally lost my train of thought. That's great. Um, <laughs> I've never seen that before ever. <laughs> I know it's crazy. Um, so it's I, probably because I went on too many tangents. I <laughs> know that's okay. Um, if people want more information about hyperhidrosis in general, you know, using your organization as a starting point, where can we find you? You can find us at sweathelp.org. We're also in on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Facebook, we are sweating stops here. Instagram, Twitter, we are um, we know sweat, and we also have some amazing YouTube. But you can certainly see all of our videos and listen to our podcast right from Sweat Help um, in the on the Sweat Help website. But one thing, if I could could just to, to do a little ask here, one. Yeah. 
really awesome way to increase awareness of hyperhidrosis and have an empowering moment is to have your employer match your donations. And what that does is that gets HR to know about hyperhidrosis and imagine how lovely it would have been for the last job interview you went to for someone to have already known about hyperhidrosis. And it helps the IHHS stay afloat and keep the lights on. So um, think about that as a, a, you know, for Hyperhidrosis Awareness Month, think about that as a, on a to-do list. To yeah, do something that's, for yourself that's and something for us. Great information because nonprofits need all the help they can get. Mm -hmm. um, final question for you, if you could only tell patients with hyperhidrosis one thing, what, what would that be? Oh, that you're worth fighting for. Absolutely. <laughs> Not well done. Um, I did too. Great. So now we're crying, but it's fine. Anyway, thank you everyone for joining me and Lisa uh, for this conversation about sweat. Um, you're not alone. For more information on treatments and finding a provider who can help you treat your hyperhidrosis, you can visit sweathelp.org. And for more information about how to start liking the skin that you're in, you can visit my blog at mylifeasapuddle.com. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Maria.